Hey guys, what's up? John here from flyatmikealpha.com with the FAA Safety Team and tonight we're bringing you an awesome presentation on inspecting your aging aircraft. What you need to look for on those old airplanes that we all fly. So we'll go ahead and give everyone just about another 60 seconds here to tune in, get checked into the event, and then we'll go ahead and get started. See you guys soon. Hey everyone, welcome to the FAST Seminar. I'm John Kotwicki from flyatmikealpha.com and tonight I'm going to be talking to you about inspecting your aging aircraft. Some tips and tricks you can use when pre flighting your airplane, looking through the paperwork, and just ideas to keep up with all the changes happening to your older airplane. And we'll go over all of those to give you a better understanding of how to stay safe flying your GA airplane. So before we get too far into it here, I want to go over CFI at flyatmikealpha.com. That is the email address where you can post any questions you have during this event. Go ahead and email them right there. You can also post them if you're watching this on YouTube. Go ahead and just post them in the comment section. Or if you're on flyatmikealpha.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and you can post them in the comment section there if you're already signed in and logged in as a member. If you're not a member, no problem. Don't worry about it. Just go ahead and email your questions to CFI at flyatmikealpha.com. We will address them the best we can at the end of this presentation. It's going to be about an hour here, guys. I'm not going to waste too much of your time. We'll spend about 60 minutes going through everything. And then at the end, we'll go ahead and take a little short break. I'll get some water because I'll be doing a lot of talking tonight. And then we'll go ahead and address some of your questions that you might have. Now, as far as getting credit for this webinar, right below this video on flyatmikealpha slash fast, so flyatmikealpha.com slash F-A-A-S-T, Right underneath there, you're gonna see the little box where you can fill out your name, first, last name, and your email address. Make sure you use the email address you use for fasafety.gov, all right? That way it'll go to your FAST account. Now, I know it says subscribe right there. Just click the little subscribe button. You're not subscribing to anything. You're simply just going to send your information to a nice little list for us, so it's gonna make it a lot easier for me at the end of this evening to put all your information into fasafety.gov, and then we'll go ahead and delete that list of your names and emails. You're not gonna get any junk mail from us, we promise. Just go ahead. If you want credit for this webinar, make sure you fill out your first, last name, and your email address on fasafety.gov, all right? Now, What's in it for me with them? That's one of my favorite topics, right? So more importantly, what's in it for you? I don't want to waste your time, so we're going to make the best of our 60 minutes together because we've all got busy schedules, right? So we're going to be looking at certain things that you want to keep an eye out for on old airplanes. We'll go ahead and talk about what to look for on a pre-flight, what to look for in the books, and then how to stay current with updates on your old airplane. So. What are we looking for in the maintenance logs? What are some key topics to keep an eye out for a pre-flight? What are the best practices to do a pre-flight besides just following the basic checklist? And then of course, what tools and resources are out there for us as pilots to stay current with things as they're changing on all our old airplanes besides just airworthiness directives. We all know about those, but some other things to keep an eye out for. We'll go over all that. So now I don't want to spend a ton of time tonight on boring graphs and statistics. I know uh, a lot of people Elsewhere, I love those. I personally do not. So this will be the only boring graph of the night, I promise. Mishaps flying due to neglecting things on your pre-flight, okay? So the second most deadly casual factor in fatal accidents here is going to be neglecting items on a pre-flight or things that you should have seen on a pre-flight that the pilot didn't because they were quick or they didn't do a pre-flight at all. So these are items that you could have caught just by doing a proper pre-flight and it ended with a really bad day for some folks. So that's our first boring graph and our last one. Next question I got for you guys here is how old is old? Okay, so we got a nice brand new little fancy Cessna here. We got a really old something or other. It was built long before I was ever born. I have no idea, but it's really old. We typically associate really old airplanes with 
you know, maintenance issues and not so safe and new airplanes with, ah, turn the key, get in, go fly. It's fine, right? But as we'll find out during this presentation, that's not really the case. So we'll go ahead and address that question again at the end. In the meantime, let's talk about this, right? The percentage of maintenance related accidents has not changed over time. What does that mean? Well, all the airplanes in the United States are getting older. We're flying an aging aircraft fleet here. That just is the way it is. New airplanes are crazy expensive, so I prefer to buy older ones. We're all flying older airplanes, but the percentage of maintenance related accidents has not changed as time has gone on, as the airplanes have gotten older. So what it's telling you really is you're just as likely to have a maintenance problem on a new airplane as you are an old airplane. So just because you're flying something old doesn't mean it's any more likely to have problems. As long as we're keeping up with maintenance, it can be just as safe and a new airplane that's neglected can be just as dangerous. So old damage history is also rarely an issue. So when I look back in the logbooks, I'm going to go buy, say like a 1965, 1967 Piper Cherokee. And I see, oh man, they broke the nose gear off this thing in 1975. And it's flowing 3,000 hours since, and it's been flying for, you know, 40, 50 years. It's probably not a huge deal. Um, if there was any issues with that, it probably would have already happened. I mean, obviously damage history is damage history, but it's nothing to get too wrapped around the axle about. There's plenty of airplanes out there that have had serious catastrophic events uh, that didn't have any damage history in the past. So there's a lot of airplanes that have just been basically run hard and beat up, and then something fails like a horizontal stabilizer and the airplane noses in, but there was no specific damage history in the books on it. Also, a really important point I want to drive home here, and it's hard even for me or anyone really, it's hard for even mechanics to get past. Uh, a nice new paint job means absolutely nothing. You can paint a turd, it is in fact, at the core, still a turd. Uh, you really, new paint on an airplane should not make you want to inspect it less. Old paint should not make you want to inspect it more. Uh, you want to actually be kind of wary of new paint because new paint could be covering up a lot of things underneath the surface. If I had my way, if the paint was all old and flaked off an old airplane, well, it's not great, but hey, at least I can see the metal underneath because paint doesn't hold the airplane together. The actual aluminum does. If paint is all that's holding your airplane together, you've got bigger problems. Uh, we'll probably have a nice little case study about you here soon, too. Anyways, let's go ahead and take a short look at this video of what I'm looking for specifically on a walk around, more so than just your general you know, checklist from Cessna or Piper. Obviously all those things are important. Let's go ahead and watch this video and see a few extra things, you know, little key tidbits that we can take a look. Make sure nuts and bolts are tight and actually touching the surface that they're supposed to be touching. You can see threads poking through the other end of the nut. You don't see a nut with no thread showing on the other side, indicating that might be loose or not grabbing as well as it was designed to. Take a look underneath the belly of the airplane. The belly of the airplane is going to tell you a lot, tell you a great story about what the engine is doing, how much oil is it spitting out, how often does that airplane get washed. A lot of flight school airplanes don't get washed very often, especially on the belly, so it can tell you a lot of history under there. What type of oil is there, what type of dirt, what color is it, is it black, white, is it just really oily and sticky, is it dripping, does it have a ton of dirt stuck to it, does it have red fluid streaking down it. Then after that, go ahead and work your way back to the tail, take a look at the tail skid. Does it ground down at all? Eh, you know, a lot of them are. But is it punched up into the tail? Did it get hit really hard? Or just rub a little bit along the runway? A little bit of paint missing there, a little bit of material missing, not the end of the world. We don't see much grinding on this one. If you see that it's actually, the whole thing's pushed up into the tail cone, that's a much bigger problem because it indicates a very hard tail strike or a lot of material missing. Shows that's just been ground down too many times. Go ahead and wiggle the wing up, down, in, out, forward, back a little bit. See if you hear any clunking, any strange noises. And after you do that, come back around, do the same thing on the tail. Whether it's a Cessna or Piper with a stabilator or horizontal stabilizer, or with a high wing or a low wing, do the exact same thing. Lightly with your fingertips, up and down on the stabilizer, in a little bit in and out motion, not jerking the whole airplane around or anything, just with your fingertips, just a little light motion. Trying to get a feel for if anything's loose or clunking around. Go ahead and drop the flaps and look behind there. Look at all the support structure on the airplane, especially where they have these holes drilled out. Sometimes cracks will form between the holes because of course, material is missing to save weight, but also that creates a little bit of a weak area. Go ahead and look at where the rivets are near the edges of metal. Make sure there's no cracks forming from the rivet head back towards the edge of the metal. Here we can see some smoking rivets. We know that there's probably most likely a little bit of minor corrosion between that rivet head and the material, but there's only two smoking rivets out of 
hundreds here, so not a huge issue for us. We can go ahead and poke our head back here into the empennage and take a look and just kind of poke around. Take your cell phone, turn on the flashlight on it, put it to record, record a little movie, and you can actually see things twisting your phone around in there that you might not be able to see just by putting your head back there. You're looking for dirt, grime, grease. Any sort of dirt and grime and grease that hasn't been cleaned off will attract moisture. This little hole right here is actually really important because we're trying to make sure that it's clear and unobstructed. If it was blocked, any sort of moisture or water stuck back there wouldn't have a way to drain out. Go ahead and tilt your phone around. Take a look at some of those other harder to reach places so you can actually see if there's any cracks or corrosion forming. Go ahead and touch the cables. Just bounce them back around a little bit just with your fingertips. You're not jerking on them or anything. This should be fairly tight, but not so tight that it sounds like a guitar string when you pluck it. And they sh certainly should not be loose to where there's a lot of slop in them. Look around for the general overall condition of the tail. This one's obviously very clean. Looks great to me. Anything that's dirty though, keep this in mind. If it's dirty, A, it could attract moisture and cause corrosion. B, if it's dirty, how did that mechanic actually really inspect it on the last 100 hour or last annual? If it's dirty, it didn't get checked like it should. One of the first steps of doing a 100 hour annual properly is to really clean the airplane really well, not just the outside, not just the belly, but also the interior, making sure you can actually see the metal and see if there's any cracks forming. Go ahead and lift up the back seat. Take a look at the battery box, see if there's any corrosion from any sort of battery acid dripping. Make sure all the cables are actually set on the pulleys, nothing's jumped off a pulley. Look for the general overall condition. If anything looks amiss, any cracks, corrosion, lots of dirt and grease could be a red flag. We can see a little bit of rust on the bottom here of the seat, but at least the foam's not falling in and getting into places where it shouldn't be, so that's a good thing. A little bit of surface rust, not the end of the world, but if it was to the point where it was cracking and breaking, then we'd be a little concerned about things getting to where they shouldn't be and extra dirt and grease back there, especially foam falling off a seat can cause issues. Tuck, go ahead and tuck your head up underneath the panel. Or if you can't fit your head underneath there, just set your cell phone to record a movie, turn the light on on it, and go ahead and move some things around. Take a look, and then you can look at it, your cell phone afterwards. Here we can see that there's some torque sealant on these bolts right here, and that's showing us that those bolts haven't turned. Those nuts haven't spun off at all. They're exactly set in the same position as when they got marked with torque sealant. That's a good thing. We can see a cotter pin here. We got the cotter key. We see some threads showing on the other side of the nut. That looks great. We're looking at the chain and the sprockets for our ailerons, making sure everything's where it needs to be. Here's one of your evil little things to look for on a Piper. That is your brake master cylinder. We have co-pilot and pilot brakes on this one. So there's two master cylinders on each side, four master cylinders total, plus the master cylinder for the parking brake. And all those are potential areas to get air into the system and get soft brakes. Look for any sort of red hydraulic fluid dripping down or any sort of stickiness around those brake master cylinders. That's going to be the red flag that if it's leaking fluid, it's probably going to suck in some air. You could get some soft, spongy brakes eventually. Here's the backseat of another Piper Cherokee. We can see that there's a little more dirt here. These little tubes here are actually vents for the battery box. So you want to look for any sort of corrosion uh, happening around there from battery acid. Again, look at making sure pulleys weren't jumped. Here we can see insulation. That's a big red flag on older airplanes with that insulation. That tends to trap moisture against the aluminum and cause corrosion. A lot of the airplanes have had that removed from them. We're looking for any sort of cracks where the wings actually bolt onto the spar there. And there again, we have a nice little drain hole that's clear and obstructed. So any moisture is going to drain out. So we don't have to worry too much about corrosion forming between the lap joints and the metal. We can go ahead and see where we have those bolts bolting on for our wing, actually. So definitely want to check those out. And then, oh, hey, look, a penny. Also, go ahead and pull up the carpeting and look. There we go. We have another little drain hole. It's clear and obstructed. There are some spare parts, a little extra nut there. Looks like we have an extra screw there from the last inspection. Wonderful. That happens on old flight training airplanes. Nothing to be too alarmed about. Then go ahead and look at the seat rails. We can see these seat rails are a little bit more oblong or elongated than we might like them to be. The hazard with that is your seat could go flying on back when you go ahead and take off. Next, underneath the cowling, this is a control cable for your carburetor heat. Same thing for carburetor heat, mixture, throttle. Make sure those cables don't have any sharp bends in them. They're not rusty or corroded. They don't have any heat damage that could possibly make them get stuck, so they're going to slide freely. Come over here to your aileron and see if you have an aileron weight. Make sure if it's supposed to have an aileron weight that it's actually in fact there and it moves freely and it's not being bound up on anything. Look at your nuts and bolts underneath the yellow on hinge. Make sure they're not too rusty, uh, hopefully no rust. Make sure that you actually see threads showing on each end of the nut so you know that it's actually biting into that bolt. It's not about to twist off or slide off or get ripped off there under load. Look for any corrosion at the trailing edge of the flap and the uh, aileron. Here is exactly why you don't push on an airplane. Push it back by pushing on the cowling. You push on the prop, not the spinner or the cowling. 
make sure the cowling actually fits the airplane well. We can see here, well, it looks like we're missing a screw along with that cowling doesn't line up very well. And then look at this belly. Well, it's a flight training airplane, so it doesn't get washed often, but that's good. It gives you a good indication as to what kind of health this airplane is in. It looks like it's spraying a little bit of oil back there. And also, of course, our missing screw right there. And the fact that they're using a giant washer on that means the cowling's a little damaged. So that's not exactly how Piper intended it to be. So that's a little bit of a red flag. We can see a little bit of surface corrosion underneath the paint. What we're looking at here is the rivets and the little dimples in the rivets. Those you want to see. Each rivet, when it's set, gets a little dimple. If the dimple's missing, it's probably because that airplane was repainted, they took a sander to it, and accidentally hit the rivet head with a sander, knocked some rivet material away, and now that rivet's not exactly as strong as it was intended to be, and they should be drilled out and replaced at the next inspection. Even after an airplane gets repainted, you should still see those little dimples. That means they use paint stripper rather than just a sander to scrape the paint away and unfortunately scrape away some of the rivet material as well. So there's a few tips for your pre-flight. Now let's go ahead and talk about the paperwork side of things, right? So for paperwork, we all know Aero, right? That's the airworthiness registration radio operator's license when you're outside the United States for the aircraft and for the pilot. And then the O, the POH or AFM, depending on what year the aircraft was built, you need to have that on board. And the W, the weight and balance. So uh, we have all those paperwork, pieces of paperwork on board. Then we have things like STCs and 337s that we should see in that big stack of maintenance logbooks. Now, what is an STC and what is a 337 form, if you're unfamiliar? So let's say we want to make a change to the aircraft. It was built a certain way with a 150 horsepower engine and it was built with you know certain size tires and certain radios and all that. If we're going to start changing those things, like say we put in a Garmin 430, we put on bigger tires, we put on uh, maybe a new uh, ADSB receiver and a transmitter in and out, so you have uh, ADSB in and out for the 2020 mandate. So you go ahead and put that in. That's not how Cessna or Piper intended the aircraft to be built back in, whether it's 1960 or 2000, and no one had heard of ADSB back then. So you're going to have to have some sort of supplemental type certificate for that piece of equipment that basically the FAA says, yes, this piece of equipment will work with this airplane on that type certificate because although it's not the way Cessna intended it to be built in 1960 to have an ADSB uh, receiver and transceiver, well, now you can do that. The paperwork's been approved. And so when you have an STC that's done on the aircraft, you're also going to have a 337 form filled out by the mechanic who installs the piece of equipment. So a 337 form is for a major repair or alteration. Could be a new windshield, could be that ADSB radio or transmitter you're putting in the airplane. And we want to make sure that we have all those pieces of paperwork for uh, our aircraft in that stack of maintenance logs. Good news is if you're missing any of these pieces of paper, and we're going to look at some examples here in just a moment in another video. If you're missing any of those pieces of paperwork, well, they're really easy to get replaced by just going ahead, assuming the mechanic, when they first made the paper, piece of paper, they filed it with the FAA like they were supposed to, you can call up OKC, or you can go on the FAA website and request a little CD-ROM for $10, and that will give you every single piece of paper that's attached to that end number. All the 337 forms, all the bills of sale, a lot of history about your airplane that you may not even know is all on file in OKC, and they can send that to you in a nice little digital copy, and then you can play it in your computer and go ahead and see... Uh, See a little bit more information about your airplane. You can order the paper copies too, but they charge you per sheet, so it's just easier to get the $10 disc. I like to do that anyways, especially if I'm going to look at maybe buying a new airplane. Uh, next, after that, obviously we have required inspections have to be in the logbooks. We have our required logbooks have to actually be there. So what's a required logbook? Because a lot of airplanes out there have an engine log, an airframe log, and that's it. Your average Piper Cherokee or Cessna may only have that. So what do you really need to have? You need to have a logbook for each appliance. So oftentimes you'll see propeller entries placed in the airframe log or in the engine log and just kind of all scattered throughout. There should really be at a very bare minimum, if you have minimum equipment on your airplane, a propeller logbook, an engine logbook, and an airframe logbook. If you have additional big appliances, then they should have their own logbooks to go along with it. Uh, and then of course, make sure all the entries are appropriately signed. So certificate number and uh, signed there should be a signature, a certificate number, and a date uh, on that logbook entry. Now let's go ahead and look at some examples, and we're going to go A to Z. This is a pretty in-depth video we're going to take a look at here of every single piece of paper that should be with your airplane in that stack of uh, papers, either inside the aircraft or just in that big whole stack of all your maintenance logbooks separate from the aircraft. So for starters, we're going to come back here to the tail section. And back here near the tail, we're going to go ahead and find the data plate for the airplane. So 
First thing I wanna do is go ahead and actually write down the serial number of the airplane, obviously the make and model and everything, but the serial number for the airplane, take a note on that, and then after I've done that, I'll go ahead and climb up in the cockpit and see what sort of additional equipment, if any, is installed on this airplane. I'm also kind of looking around the outside of the airplane while you're at it, see if there's any extra wing tips that have been installed on it that aren't quite standard, aren't quite stock. And we'll go ahead, pop open the door here, take a look up inside, and everything looks fairly standard to me with the exception of we've got some radios that probably didn't come with the airplane. We've got an RNAV unit and we've got some sort of DME old GPS thing there, whatever that heck that is. We've got an intercom that probably did not come with the aircraft either. And we're just looking for anything else that didn't come installed on this airplane. So maybe if you had like a Garmin 430 or something like that, you'd want to make a note of it. We're just making notes on everything we see that didn't actually come with the airplane. And we'll go ahead and note any model numbers that we can, if they're still visible on there. And then we'll go ahead and start searching for ADs on the FA website. Before we do that, we'll probably want to go ahead, hop down here and just do one last quick check under the cowling and make sure that there's nothing weird underneath the cowling that's been installed, maybe like a Tannis heater or something like that. And I know just from checking this airplane before, everything's pretty stock on here with the exception of a four place CGT EGT. So we'll also want to go ahead and make a note of that and see if there's any ADs that apply to it. So we've got our serial number and we have our model number of the airplane. Now let's go ahead and go on to the FAA website and see exactly what ADs are going to apply to that aircraft. So just FAA.gov, go over to regulations and policies, and from there, or within this directives, and then go ahead and just search for the make and model number. So in this case, it's a PA28151, we'll search that. And the results we get are, it looks like we have about 19 air within this directives that come up with a uh, Piper Warrior PA28-151. So now we can go ahead and click on each one of these and see what all applies to our aircraft. I'm gonna be a little bit lazy here and simply just print out this list for starters. And once I print out this list with all the AD numbers there, I'm then gonna go ahead and compare that to the list that's already in the maintenance logbooks and just make sure all 19 are shown in the maintenance logbooks. And then I'll have information on how to comply with them and how they were complied with in there rather than actually having to click on and open up each and every single one of these. So after we look up all the ADs on the FA website, then I'd like to come out to the actual logbooks for the airplane and start going through them, making sure that you have not only the required inspections, but that the ADs have been signed off and that you can also go back in the logbooks and check for any of that additional equipment that's been installed, verify that it's actually in the logbooks and verify the serial numbers on it so you can go back and check the AD numbers on the FAA website. And we can see here in the log entry for the annual where it says CAD compliance sheets for details. So it's actually uh, not going to have any information in there specifically, it just says no applicable engine ADs due at this time. And then in our airframe logbook, it'll probably say the same thing CAD sheet for compliance details. And then we'll go ahead and compare our sheet we printed from FA.gov with the AD compliance sheets in the other folder. So it looks like the only AD that was uh, due at time of annual was AD 7607-12. We'll go ahead and verify all that on our AD sheets that we printed off from FA.gov. And then of course, look at all the additional equipment and look at the AD compliance sheets in the separate folder to verify that. There's our annual inspection in the airframe log. We have our IFR certification right here. And it has the accompanying little data sheet that tells us the errors for the altimeter at all the different altitudes. You always are gonna have to have a prop log because you need a log book for every appliance on the airplane. So you have the airframe, you have the engine, which is an appliance, and then you have your propeller, which is also an appliance. Even though it's a fixed pitch propeller, you should still have a log book that goes with it. And certainly you'll want to have it if you have a uh, constant speed prop, like on most complex airplanes. We have that entry there. It states no propeller ADs due at this time. Reinstall the spinner, everything's airworthy, terrific. That was done at the same time as the annual. Then we can go ahead and let's go ahead while we got this sheet here, we'll knock out all our ADs that apply to the airframe. So we're gonna compare the bi-weekly on the FA website against this document here, every AD number, when it was effective, the subject, and when it was last complied with, so everything was complied with at the annual in November of 2017, 
and the method of compliance, we can see here where these are not applicable by aircraft serial number. So how do we know that it's not applicable by aircraft serial number? Well, we go onto the AD list for the PA28-151 here. We come on down to 74-24-12. That was one of the compliance sheet that said it wasn't applicable for based on the serial number. And we come down here and we look at what serial numbers this was applicable to. So it applies to model PA28-151, our airplane, 28-7415, blah, blah, through 28-75. And we have a 28-76, so it's above that, so it does not apply. Some of these others are not applicable due to the equipment not being installed, like the fil affected filter not installed. Others were complied with at a previous date and time, referred back to in the old logbooks. And then everything is signed off by the a &P or IA that completed it. Now we'll go ahead and look at engine ADs. And engine ADs are totally separate from airframe ADs. So actually while I was doing that walk around on the airplane, I did pull the model number and the serial number off the engine data plate right on the actual case of the engine. Went on the FAA website and found the 0320, typed it in, found all the applicable ADs to it. And we went ahead and did the same thing, select it all, print it out, make sure that we have them all listed in the engine AD uh, compliance sheets. And then of course we can always click on them if we want to find out some details on any of these that might apply to our airplane. Same thing when we're looking at this, we're simply looking at the model number, the parts list and issue, serial number, see if it's applicable to our airplane, our engine. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. If it is, then simply come on down here and it tells you exactly how it needs to be complied with. Obviously, since this one is for a fuel injected engine, it's not gonna be for our airplane. Still wanna verify the serial numbers though, just in case something weird's going on. We have all our ADs for our engine, the engine serial number. So we'll always want the engine serial number, which we get off the actual engine data plate. And it's the same exact idea, not applicable by date of engine manufacturer, not applicable by engine serial number, and so on. And as you flip through all these, you'll make sure that everything you printed off from the FAA website on the engine ADs is all listed here. So every single AD from the FAA website should be listed here. And then you know the logs are up to date, everything's included, and you can see exactly how those ADs were in fact complied with. Some of them are not applicable due to just the operating of the engine. Obviously no sudden stoppage has occurred, so that one doesn't apply. And this one was complied with, for example, by there being no record of connecting rod maintenance during the time frame specified. So no maintenance was done to the connecting rods between those dates specified in that particular ID number. All signed off like the others, and we're good to go. For the propeller, we go ahead and check here. We have the propeller serial number. You can find that when you remove the spinner from the propeller. So I look up this one a little bit differently because it's a little harder to search, something like Sensenic. So I just go S for make and model, come on down to Sensenic Propeller Manufacturing Company, and then you have your 74D. You can actually expand all these 74D models since that's what it's telling us in the, uh, in the prop log, and we don't really want to go ahead and take off the spinner to verify. So if we trust that it's a 74D model, then we can see what ADs will apply to it. They're all duplicated. This is all three, and we come back from here to all three on our sheet. In all three there, we can see it's not applicable by date of manufacture, not applicable propeller manufactured in 2007, and not applicable propeller manufactured in 2007. So everything's not applicable basically by date of manufacture. So now we know all the ADs on a propeller are current and legal. And then here we have appliances. Now we have more than these appliances installed in the airplane, so we're gonna go ahead and verify. But the appliance like the ignition switch, it was method of compliance, operational inspection. So the ANP verified that the ignition switch was okay per the AD's directions by inspecting it. This one was superseded and riveted or snap ring impulse couplings. It's not applicable due to the engine model. So. The other appliances are still gonna be things like the GPS we have installed in there, the RNAV unit. We're gonna go ahead and verify those separately on the FAA's website. So now for each and every single appliance, like we said, the GPSs, the RNAV, all the additional equipment installed, and even the JPI that was just installed, we have to go ahead and find out if there's any ADs that apply to them. So how I start out with this is now I go into the files of that aircraft, I'm looking for a 337 form. So I'm looking in the maintenance logs, I'm gonna to try to find a 337 form, and that's exactly what a 337 form looks like this form right here and it's a major repair or alteration to the airplane so anytime the airplane is really banged up in an accident or incident uh, there'll be a 337 form for that anytime that you put new equipment that modifies the type certificate on the airplane there'll be a 337 for that so in this case installing something like an rnav or a 430 or even a new windshield a new windscreen uh, in this case installing a jpi digital engine analyzer that will have a, an accompanying 337 form on there. And what it basically tells us is, yeah, it was all installed properly. That's all great. And it's an airframe modification. It was bolted into the instrument panel. 
and we come on down here to what we really care about, and we see what the mechanic, what the ANP had to write. He said, he installed the EDM 700 in accordance with the JPI Instruments STC SA2586NM. Then he updated the weight and balance and the equipment list in the aircraft log. So we'll have to find the updated weight and balance, and we'll have to find that updated equipment list as well. And then if we want to get really ambitious here, if you're really curious, you can go ahead and actually read what that STC is. And all you have to really do is just type in STC Sierra Alpha 2586 November Mike, and you'll be able to find the JPI STC on their website. Scroll on down to the aircraft that you have that it applies to and see any specific notes on it and see how the mechanic actually went about installing it. But ultimately, we know it's an EDM 700. And so now we can go ahead and go to the FA website, search for ADs pertaining to it. We look it up. We find no ADs then we're good. So there's no ADs that apply to our JPI instruments. Additional equipment, we'll have to do that for every single piece of additional equipment installed on the airplane. Now, we're not going to go ahead and show you every single one of those because it's going to take a while, but you get the idea of how you're going to have to go about handling each additional piece of equipment installed. That's why it's so nice flying brand new airplanes that haven't been modified yet because none of these forms exist or very few of them exist and it makes your life so much easier to make sure the aircraft is indeed airworthy. When you're handling an airplane from the 60s, 70s, 80s, like you're most likely to fly as a new commercial pilot, you've got your work cut out for you to make sure this thing is airworthy. Let's move it along now and take a look at the rest of the logbooks. Now, another thing you're going to come across when you're looking through your airplane logs are yellow tags. Yellow tags are for really any sort of equipment that's repaired, replaced, or installed on the airplane. It's gonna be some sort of airworthiness release for that piece of equipment from an FA approved station. It's gonna have the station number, the description. So this one is a transceiver, it's a radio, King KX-170. So for the KX-170 radio that's installed in there, here's our yellow tag. So we actually have that, so we know it's legitimate uh, equipment. We could verify the serial number on here, 3441, with the serial number on the actual uh, King radio in the airplane. Here we got a new transponder installed in the airplane. So we have an airworthiness release certificate for it. So if you buy something off eBay, if you buy it from Aircraft Spruce, if you buy it from wherever, it should come with a yellow tag and it'll say repaired uh, in accordance with IAW, King Maintenance Manual, part number blah blah is the part number of the maintenance manual, revision two, dated January of 1972, and then it's signed off by the person who did it, their certificate number, the date that it was done, and of course, all the information for the FA station that actually completed the work. Then you have your normal logbook entry that says, okay, they removed and replaced the transponder, KT-78, with uh, blah, 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 signed off by whoever did it, that a &P. Lastly, I want to talk to you guys about the POH, AFM, whatever you want to call it, PIM, whatever it is, what's required to legally be on the airplane? Well, for aircraft manufactured, after 1978, you're going to need an approved airplane flight manual. Now, that's going to be something that could say POH on it, could say uh, AFM on it. Ultimately, it's going to have to have a serial number that matches the aircraft, and there's only going to be one copy of it. If you buy a pilot information manual from the front desk of your flight school, that's not going to be approved to be in the airplane if it was manufactured after 1978. It needs to have a serial number on it, probably the end number as well, and the airplane flight manual, the AFM pages are gonna be stuck in there. Things that are like how to work this JPI that we have installed on the aircraft, how to work the RNAV or a 430 if it's installed on the aircraft. It'll have supplemental information in with it. If the aircraft was 1978 or older, then it's just gonna be a hodgepodge of information from a pilot's operating manual, owner's manual, whatever documents could be combined to somehow provide the pilot with the information he needs to operate the aircraft safely. That's ultimately what the FA requires for an aircraft manufactured prior to 1979. Ultimately, that's going to be a combination of the AFM and the owner's manual or POH or whatever you want to call those documents. Everything needs to be there. Ultimately, if you want to see exactly what has to be there, if you think some pages are missing or something like that, you can look in part 91, part 23, or whatever part that aircraft is certified under and the type of certificate is actually certified under, then you can figure out exactly what needs to be required on board that specific aircraft. Right below this video here, there's a little checklist, and that's everything that you should be able to find in the maintenance logs, and make sure, of course, you're finding the right amount for everything. So there should be one weight and balance. There should be one air within a certificate. There should be multiple yellow tags, things like that. So just use common sense when you're looking through those documents. And when in doubt, refer back to the part that the aircraft is certified under. So if it's a Part 23 airplane, go through Part 23, see what's actually required to be on there. Silly things even like the lettering on the airplane has to be a certain size, certain dimension, certain font, certain colors. Otherwise, you could be fined $10,000 every time you take off if you have the font a little too small or a little too spread out or not contrasting colors or something like that. Maybe you have too many decals and lines going through it. 
So be careful with all that. Make sure you're ultimately just asking questions, talking to people around the airport, talk to the ANP, talk to the IA. Don't just blindly get in an airplane and fly it and assume it's airworthy. Be able to justify to someone why you think it is airworthy and what sort of due diligence you've done on your end. Any questions on this, go ahead and post them up in the commercial pilot forum online at flyatmikealpha.com. Go through the airworthiness and maintenance lesson on the commercial checkride bootcamp. And as always, use your best judgment, fly safe. Now, I know there was a lot of information in that video, but if you do have any questions, just like we said, you, at the beginning of this presentation, you can email them to CFI at flyatmikealpha.com, or you can even just post them up on that link right below the video. That was flyatmikealpha.com slash answers. Uh, it's a video from our commercial pilot boot camp, so it's a little excerpt of one of our courses, and that's why it's fairly in-depth, because it's really built for the commercial pilot level, but there's no reason why a private pilot shouldn't hold themselves to the same standards to make sure their airplane is in fact airworthy. So moving along past that, next we've got the pre-flight. So we're going to go ahead and use the information that we found in the records to really help us conduct this pre-flight. So now that we know we have certain STCs or certain modifications to the airplane, we can keep an eye out for those specific things. We'll definitely use an approved checklist like the one from the POH, but you also want to go a little bit beyond that, right? So not just the normal pre-flight checklist that comes from Checkmate that's stored in the airplane or that the flight school gives you or that's in your POH from Cessna. Use that. Make sure you're doing all those steps. Make sure if you're using like a Checkmate checklist or one of those, you know, ones you buy from Sporties or from Aircraft Spruce that it actually agrees and has all those things from the POH. So you're actually doing what the manufacturer intended for you to be doing, not just what some arbitrary author intended and made a pretty checklist with. Uh, so make sure that you're doing all those things, but a little bit more too. And we'll talk about a little bit more here in a sec. We're going to show you that one video of what to kind of look for, but we'll go ahead and go over a few more things. So eyes and hands are just as important as the checklist. Really take your time, touch, feel, look, and taking your time is really the key here because it's super easy just to do a pre-flight. You know, your first time takes you 20, 25 minutes. And after doing it a hundred times, it only takes you two minutes. But did you really check the airplane that thoroughly after two minutes? And as we saw from that first fun graphic, maintenance issues do cause problems in a flight. And some of those maintenance problems can develop not slowly over the course of time, but rather quickly. And you want to be able to catch that stuff on a pre-flight each time before you go fly. Whenever you have the opportunity to look around the airplane, take that opportunity to go ahead and double check things. Not just, oh, shut down, stop, throw a friend in there, and then fire up and go again. Take time, walk around, check the oil, check the fuel, all that. So looking for beyond just what the checklist calls for, big thing, and then work in sections, okay? Just break it up, you know, that whole, you know, like if you're gonna be a photographer, and I'm not really much of a photographer, but if you were to kind of do one of those whole deals, um, work in sections, take your time with the airplane, because otherwise it's really easy to miss things. These wings on a 172 are actually pretty darn big, they don't look it, but there's a lot of surface area there. There's a lot of surface area all over our airplanes, and it's really easy to miss things if you're not working in sections and then being like, okay, I'm done with that section, now I'll go to that section, now I'll go to that section, and just taking your time, breaking it up into easy to see chunks. You'll see a little bit more that way, trust me, you really will. Do it with a rag too. I like walking around doing my pre-flight, holding my rag in a hand and just kind of wiping the airplane here and there, seeing what color things are, is that oil, is that fuel, whatever it might be. Um, really taking your time to kind of clean the airplane as you go around. Cleaning the airplane is a great way to learn more about it. And if you happen to be renting airplanes, hey, barter for them, you know? I'll uh, clean your airplane and wash it. You'll learn a lot more about it when you're doing that in exchange for some flight time because uh, aircraft rentals are pretty expensive right now. Anyways, some common things we all know about, right? So hold up your fuel to the sky and it's going to look blue. Hold it up to the white airplane and then the water in that is going to actually look white. You're going to know it's water, it's not fuel. So Always hold your fuel sampler against a white surface, against white paint or something, so you're not tricking yourself looking at a whole cup full of water and it looks like blue fuel. That's kind of an easy thing. Run the flaps up and down. We all put the flaps down right on the pre-flight, that's part of the checklist, but you actually really slowly work that flap handle up and down to listen and feel for the travel of the flaps. Do you put the flaps down and really listen and look at the travel? Are they coming down evenly? Are they getting kind of jittery on the track? Is it all working the way it's supposed to? Taking your time, you know, just listen and be alert, not just going through the motions is the point of that. So during your pre-flight, do not be blowing on pitot tubes or pitot vanes trying to clear out dirt. Don't blow on static ports. Those are really sensitive instruments on the other side of that, and you totally have enough force with just by blowing on it or by giving it a good puff of air to blow out your airspeed 
and your altimeter and your VSI and damage those instruments. And aircraft owners hate it when you do that. So if you own your own airplane, you'll really hate yourself. And if you're renting one from a flight school owner, they'll really not like you anymore. Uh, so don't do that. If you see any blockages, if you see some ants or some animals or flies or any sort of dirt or debris in the pitot tube or pitot vein or static port inlets, go ahead and call somebody over, have them clean it out for you. Be really aware that static ports may be covered up for aircraft washing or because a big storm was coming through or somebody didn't plan to fly the airplane for a long time. And so they'll put a little piece of tape over the static port so ants and things like that don't crawl in there. For some reason, in Florida, we get a lot of ants down here. And I guess pitot tubes and static ports and static lines are like the little tunnels they make underground and they just love living inside there. And it totally messes with your airspeed as soon as you take off if you didn't catch it before on your pre-flight. And you see your instruments fluttering all over the place because there's little ants getting blown around inside your static lines and pitot inlet line. So back to the tape thing though. People tape those static inlets because they're going to go wash the airplane. They don't want to get water in there, which could affect the instruments and make some kind of jittery and jerky. So they put the tape on and they forget to take it off. My favorite part is when they take the tape and they're perfectionists. So they put the tape over the static port and then they take like a little razor blade and they trim it so it nice, looks nice and round like it belongs there and like you should leave it. And then the untrained private pilot or student just goes ahead and figures it belongs there and doesn't remove it before flight. It always makes things interesting. Uh, be sure to check underneath the panel for old plastic little lines. Those are your static lines. If they're getting old and brittle and starting to crack, you're going to get static leaks. Now, think back to private pilot days, right? So, or instrument training when you were talking about using that alternate static air source, you know, either breaking the VSI or pulling a little knob for alternate static air. The static pressure around the airplane is telling us how high we are and how fast we're going. That's the purpose of the static port outside the airplane. But inside the airplane, there's a slightly lower static pressure. That's why we put the port outside the airplane. That slightly lower static pressure inside the airplane because of the way the air is flowing around the canopy and around the cockpit and fuselage causing that little bit of low pressure. If we happen to activate the alternate static source or move our static source from outside the airplane to inside the cockpit, it's lower pressure in there, meaning our altimeter is going to read a little higher. VSI is going to show a climb initially. You're going to show a higher indicated airspeed than you're really going. Also, your transponder is going to tell ATC that you're higher than you really are. So when they start yelling at you, uh, it's possibly that you have an issue with your transponder being off by 100, 200, 300 feet, maybe because of some bad static lines as a possibility among other transponder issues. So be alert for that. Look for any old, dry, cracked static lines. Looking for same thing, you know, any old, dry, cracked wires that are starting to get brittle and uh, make pretty little sparks underneath your instrument panel. Uh, they're not so pretty when they turn into flames. So next after that, pre-flight inspection techniques continued, obviously the simple stuff again, right? Check the cargo doors closed. It's really a bummer when stuff starts falling out of your airplane and you get to your destination and your case of oil and your suitcase and your spare Bose headset fell out. So make sure those are closed. Make sure you maybe you might want to lock them. That way they don't accidentally open up in flight. Some of those latches can get pretty old and worn out. So sometimes I like to not only close it and latch it, but also lock it when I'm done. And next, after that, getting into some more interesting stuff here, smoking rivets. We've all seen these, and you may or may not know what they really mean. So a smoking rivet, when we think about what a rivet is in general, a rivet's just holding two pieces of aluminum together, smushing them together. Now, as the airplane vibrates and chafes, it kind of gets a little loose, and some air and dirt and grease is able to kind of skip by that rivet head. And when you have a smoking rivet, it's basically just oil and dirt and grease blowing from inside uh, the airplane or on the other side of the skin out to the outer side of the skin, there's probably going to be a little bit of fretting corrosion, or a little bit of corrosion between the rivet and the aluminum. Is it the end of the world? Probably not. You know, if you, we saw that Piper Cherokee earlier, or Piper Warrior earlier, had two little smoking rivets, not a huge concern. Maybe, you know, somewhere down the road they can drill those out, replace them. Not the end of the world. Um, we start to see a whole bunch more. That's a little bit more concerning. It means there's more corrosion, more uh, vibration in the airplane, more things getting loose. Things aren't being held the way they were supposed to. And once things get loose and vibration continues, it usually is exponential in how quickly it kind of gets out of hand. So it's something to keep an eye on. Missing rivets is definitely something to keep an eye on here. So if you have uh, dissimilar metals, it's really common to have a missing rivet head. Now, when will we have that? That would be something like 
uh, the aileron balance weight on a Cessna. You know, we often have these little uh, lead weights mounted to the aileron on a Cessna, and it just so happens that rain sheets down that wing, and so you have water running to this lovely little spot where there's two dissimilar metals, brilliant design. So you got the lead and you got the aluminum with an aluminum rivet going through it. And guess what? Dissimilar metals, they promote corrosion, electrolysis, and all that fun stuff. Water really helps that, and this is a place where moisture can get trapped. And what you'll wind up with is you'll walk by one day, like the FAA inspector did when he walked by my airplane, he goes, hey, you're missing your rivet head. And I was like, man, I've never even noticed that. And he kind of took his thumb and flicked the next one, and he was like, oh, now you're missing two. Um, turns out all those rivets were corroded. And they really were, I mean, corrosion was almost holding the weight in place more so than the rivets were anyway. So we got those replaced. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some corrosion examples on airplanes. So we got this one right here. We can see there's some little bubbles uh, right underneath the paint. So the paint's starting to bubble. That's a sign of corrosion underneath the paint. Paint's not always your friend. You think paint's going to keep corrosion away, right? We don't want bare aluminum like this right here. Bare aluminum's bad. What you'll notice is bare aluminum, once it does corrode, it gets pretty bad and then it stops where paint can actually let moisture through and then it holds underneath there and it gets even worse. The best case scenario is to have a painted airplane with a nice fresh coat of wax and the water beads up on the wax and then it slides off before it gets down to the paint and then soaks through the paint and then hits the metal and causes corrosion and bubbling. You can look at this whole trailing edge of the flap here. Yeah, there's corrosion, but it's not atrocious for being bare metal and that's because that Moisture, once it hits the bare metal, it causes corrosion, but then it evaporates right away. It's not being held there permanently by all that paint. So paint's not always your friend. Looking here, we can see a regular just aluminum airplane. That was polished aluminum. It's not painted at all. And yeah, sure, there's a little bit of minor corrosion. We can see that pitting and oxidizing, but it's really not bad. I mean, this is parked right next to the salt water in Florida. It's not that bad for what it is. We can see here where there's some paint around the antenna, and that's actually bubbling and peeling pretty nicely. So paint clearly is not always your friend here. Paint with wax is, but if you're not gonna wash and wax your airplane regularly, then, I mean, paint's not really gonna help. And you definitely don't wanna just be painting over corrosion because that just promotes it to bubble up even more later on. The next thing we wanna be checking on our pre-flights, of course, fuel caps. Make sure they're actually on. Uh, it's super annoying when the line guys fill up the airplane and then leave them off. Um, so make sure your fuel cap's actually on. Probably the last thing I do before I get into an airplane is walk around the backside. You know, if it's a tailwheel or even a Cessna high wing, and I can look up and I can see the fuel caps are there because I'm too short to see it from in front of the airplane. I have to jump a little bit. So go ahead and check that, but also check the integrity of the fuel cap. So when you pull it off and you're checking the fuel level in the tank during your pre-flight, look at the seal. Is it dry rotted and cracked? Is it in a situation where it could possibly let water in? Is it so messed up with mud dauber's nest and dirt and dry rotted and the rubber is expanded and bloated that it's actually not going to vent anymore because a lot of our older airplanes rely on the fuel cap to be the vent for the tank. You may not find fuel vents on other airplanes and it's just the actual cap. So it's actually going to vent right through the cap. It's going to suck in air as you suck the fuel to the engine. If they can't suck in air, it's going to stop sucking fuel to the engine and your engine will quit in flight. So having any sort of blocked fuel vent whether it's a uh, fuel vent out on the wing, like a Cessna 172, where you see, you know, you make the hard right turn and all the fuel sloshes left and spills out on the ramp. And you're like, oh, there goes $3. Um, whether it's that or whether it's the fuel cap, just make sure your fuel vents are in fact good, intact. And then of course the fuel cap, it should vent, but it should also seal nicely so it's not getting a bunch of water in when it rains. Other pre-flight inspection techniques. When you got uh, this propeller here, whether it's a constant speed propeller or fixed pitch propeller, apply a little forward and aft pressure to it, all right? Just real gentle, just kind of trying to push the crankshaft in and now see if there's a lot of free play there. Go ahead and do a little side to side, a little up and down, kind of wiggle, make sure that the propeller blade is attached to the hub firmly if it is a constant speed propeller. If it's fixed, fixed pitch, still same thing, in and out a little bit, up and down, just jiggle it, make sure it's not loose, um, especially if it's wooden. Wooden props, you'll notice, uh, they'll torque them down at annual or whenever the propeller is last checked. And if it happens to be done, say like in uh, August, uh, in the morning when humidity is like 79% or in Florida 155% or whatever, well, the wood's probably swollen up and it's expanded. And they torque them down and they're nice and tight. And then you fly that airplane to Arizona and it sits for the winter where it's nice and dry and that wood contracts. All of a sudden, those bolts holding the 
uh, propeller on aren't so tight anymore. So, uh, and not just, maybe they're safety wired together, but that's not really, they were designed to be working under load. So the propellers have come off because bolts have fractured from, uh, from shearing because they weren't made to handle the shear strength. They were meant to also hold the, uh, the propeller to the hub and for the hub to take some of that torque force of spinning the propeller. So wooden propellers, watch out for that for changing climates and then just any other propeller, fixed pitch or constant speed, jiggle it around a little bit, all right? Uh, if you're inspecting a constant speed prop, some movement may be detected in the hub. I mean, it's a turning object, right? There's gonna be some free play possibly to some extent. How much is too much? This comes to personal experience, personal comfort levels, and always, always, always just track down an A&P or IA or somebody to come over and be like, hey, you think this is okay? Ask some other pilots on the ramp, hey, would you fly this? Is this okay? If it's just a little, you know, millimeter or two, or is it like a quarter inch, like clunk, clunk? That's a lot more alarming. Especially when you get to that clunk, clunk stage, you're probably gonna see some oil streaking down the propeller blade out of the hub. And uh, any oil slinging around the propeller blade, slinging down the airplane, that's gonna be a big, uh, clue that there's an oil leak up near the prop seal or uh, near the uh, hub seal on the blades. So always, whenever in doubt, find a mechanic, talk to him about it. We can go ahead and take a look at this little propeller video here. And we can see the leading edge of this prop. This is a constant speed prop, so we do the same thing. We kind of tug on a little bit, but look at the leading edge, all right? That is corrosion. Corrosion due to paint and the paint kind of wearing out a little bit along the leading edge and moisture getting underneath there and bubbling. It's not really ideal. This is a case where paint's definitely not really helping and just the ramp state in this, uh, and this airport's not really helping either. A lot of loose sand and gravel really chewing up the propeller. And you can see that fresh white corrosion on the propeller blade. Here you can see I'm kind of pulling forward and back in and out a little bit, trying to see if there's any sort of free play on that propeller hub. That's what I'm really looking for. Not jerking on it, not yanking the whole airplane around, just fingertips back and forth, get a little, get a little feel for it. You can also go ahead and place your hands on the front and back of the prop and just kind of work them feeling that whole uh, curvature of the prop in and out, sliding back and forth. See if there's any lumps or nicks or anything weird, any strange shape changes where a middle might be bowing or bending or if it's been hit before and filed out but not, you know, perfectly uh, how it should have been. If it's got any weird camber or any uh, weird shape changes, you know, that are really abrupt, that might be kind of a thing to talk to somebody about, see if it's really uh, the way it's supposed to be. So work your hands up and down it, kind of just forward and back like that along the prop hub. You should feel a nice smooth transition from the hub out to the tip. If you feel anything abnormal, just, you know, find the mechanic. Get, talk to them about it, see what they think. Other pre-flight inspection techniques. Yeah, sure, use caution around hot items. Um, they don't always print hot on the exhaust pipe like they do on the McDonald's coffee cups now. Uh, you should know as a pilot, exhaust pipes be hot, ow. So, don't grab it if it's just been flying. If you're unsure, just kind of backside your hand, you know, get close to it, touch the cowling first, maybe see if the engine's hot before you grab really hot stuff. Check items for security and looseness. So what do I do? I don't grab hold of the exhaust pipe and try to rip it off of the airplane, but I do grab hold of it and just kind of, you know, fingertips back and forth, just like with the prop, right? Just uh, back and forth. You know, is it loose? Is it clunking around? Do I hear any loose exhaust noises? Uh, exhaust is important. It helps the engine run right and also helps feed all those toxic gases away from us, the pilot and passengers. So, yeah, it's just a little free play there. See if it's, uh, you know, nice and tight the way it should be. If you see anything, you know, abnormal, of course, call over the mechanic, call over another pilot, say, hey man, what do you think about this? Get their opinion on it. Look for the uh, alternator belt. See if it's too loose, too tight. Uh, look and see if there's anything living in the airplane. Just, you know, the general conditional inspection, like it says on the checklist. Go ahead, and as you work your way down the um, the wing, check for the wing struts. You know, kind of, eh, not jerk on them, but, you know, in and out a little bit. See if there's any sort of movement, any weird noises you hear. Same thing like we did out in the wingtip, you know, moving the wingtip up and down, forward and back. Listen for any weird noises, any clunky noises. Make sure it's not going to fall off on you. Uh, and, of course, when in question, ask an AMT before flight. Check the condition of the fire extinguisher, first aid kit, flashlight, all that good stuff. Make sure it's actually filled up, make sure it's accessible, uh, preferably in inspection, and uh, make sure it's not, you know, 20 years old and the first aid kit's all like, you know, weird old band-aids that have just melted together in the Florida sun or something. So, going through all that stuff that you may not look at every flight, you know, like, hey, there's the first aid kit, but when's the last time you opened it and actually checked it? Or, hey, there is a fire extinguisher, but it's from 1983. Maybe it's time to replace it. They're kind of cheap. 
Uh, Pre-flight inspection techniques continued here. Check the flight control. Trims for freedom of movement and proper direction and travel. So working the trim all the way down, all the way up, and listen to it, feel it. Does it seem right? Is it moving the right direction? Do you see the trim tab moving nice and smoothly or is it jerking around on you? That's something that, you know, we often set it for takeoff and then we just kind of walk away and we're like, yeah, we're done. Check the full range of motion. You're gonna use it in flight, aren't you? Wouldn't you rather bind up and break on the ground than bind up and break in flight? Always listen for proper operation. If you're, uh, if you're cycling it, of course, listen if you're doing it with your hand, but if you're using the electric uh, trim on the airplane, Again, listen, see if you hear any weird noises, anything binding, anything slower or faster with that electric motor. Go ahead and rotate your fuel selector, check for full freedom of movement, and check for the proper detents. You know, that actually locks in place, that you can actually identify what both left, right, and off is, in fact. Uh, check all those positions, right? And if you feel that, like it's too hard to move, or it's uh, just kind of spinning really loose, that's something to be really alert for. You don't want fuel leaking down into your floor in your airplane, and you definitely don't want to have it vibrate out of a certain detent, especially if it's vibrating from the detent you know, all the way to off, that'd be really bad. Here's a fuel selector valve from the uh, SDRS reporting database, Service Difficulty Reporting System, uh, that shows on a uh, Piper product, the fuel valve was just basically, uh, in technical terms, all jacked up. Uh, just corroded some water in the fuel, kind of fuel that turned bad and got gummy and lots of dirt and stuff in there. The issue with this one was nobody could really tell where on and off was and it actually had spun inside there because it was so stiff and what showed on was actually became the off position. So the whole thing was just all twisted and mangled inside there. When the uh, AMP took it apart, he found that, yeah, there's a lot of dirt and corrosion issues there. We'll talk more about the uh, SDRS system here in a moment. Other stuff you may see, um, it looks right. If you just kind of tilt your head like that, it looks fine to me, right? Um, looks like somebody got a little uh, over ambitious with the tow bar here and kind of cranked on that. So if they did it enough to crank the bolt, maybe that bolt's not super important. I think it kind of is. But even if the bolt wasn't super important, do you think they maybe heard anything else when they were twisting that nose gear back and forth? Maybe it's worth checking that out. Oh, uh, here's the tail. Here's a uh, tail that it's not really so great, right? They hit it so hard that, in fact, the little eye loop thing that would hold the tail skid has been removed from the aircraft. They ground down the aluminum on the tail and then you can see the rudder got hit. Here's the fun part. Let's play like a little NTSB accident investigator for a moment. So we got the nice orange rusty bolt that got snapped off and then we got the really bright shiny aluminum. So what does that tell me is, oh, first they broke the tail skid and then a couple weeks later they hit the tail again and scraped it again. So yeah, did they get inspected after that? Did it cause any issues with the bulkhead? Uh, I mean, that's your tail section back there. Tail's kind of important. There's a lot of strain and stress on that vertical stab and horizontal stab in flight. So, you want to get that checked out. You know, not just keep flying the airplane like, eh, it's fine. Uh, and again, that's a flight school airplane. That was on the flight line at a flight school and they were flying it and they didn't seem to have any issues with that. But, at least it was out in the ramp and I was able to take some pictures of it. Here's a cool little video of that same airplane, actually, when the cow came off of it and the mechanic was working on it. I got to go ahead and see all the issues with it. So on this particular thing, what we're looking at here is the vacuum system. And we can actually see where the two vacuum systems meet together. And guess what? The rivets are snapped off. So yeah, you're getting vacuum. The instruments were working, but there's nothing to say that wasn't going to fail later on in flight and leave you with no instruments when the last few rivets holding that thing together finally went. Again, that kind of brings me back to the thing we were talking about a minute ago of just kind of grab things and don't try to rip them apart because you will, but you know, a little free play back and forth, try to see if you can get it to move back and forth and then you go, oh wow, that's not so good. If you're just looking at something, you may not really see all that's there. What we're looking at here is the very top of a nose gear strut on a Cessna 172 and that's where that plate bolts to the firewall. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but if you look closely enough, this firewall, and you take a flashlight through that little inspection hat, and you look at an angle, you'll see the shadow cast because the firewall is wrinkled. So there's firewall damage. Somebody smashed this airplane in really hard nose first. Not good. That typically, like, it can't, it maybe totals the airplane, or it does, you know, tens of thousands worth of damage. 
If I saw that A, the airplane's bent and not flying straight and not good, that needs to be fixed, so I don't want to go fly it from a flight school. B, I don't want to get blamed for it when I do rent it from the flight school. So this is a flight school rental airplane that they're renting to students. And yeah, it's definitely something that should not be flown by anyone, uh, especially students. Certainly not something I would want to rent. It's a little clearer here. You can start to see some of those ripples there from uh, the guy's nice hard landing or several hard landings or who knows what. Next thing here, some baffling around the engine. You may not be able to see this just through that little tiny inspection port on the Cessna 172, but if you see it with the cowl off, you can see the staples that were holding this baffling together are rusting out. Why is that important to you? Well, baffling really helps direct airflow around the cylinders to keep them running nice and cool. If it's starting to fall apart like that, A, you got things hanging loose underneath your engine cowl that could get kind of tangled up in other things. It's not really great. Plus, you're not going to get the proper air cooling, airflow around the engine that it's intended to. So the engine's running really hot. So what does that cause? It causes high oil temperature, low oil pressure. It causes the engine to possibly seize up or just shorten its lifespan a whole lot. So down here in Florida, where we're running really hot days anyways, and then you don't have proper air cooling, and you don't necessarily have the instruments in the airplane to tell you if your cylinder head temps are getting outrageously hot, that could be really bad. Let's take a look at our next little video here. And the next little video is... Yes, grab a hold of things, move them forward and back, up and down, left and right. It looks fine to me when you first look at it, but as soon as you start to jiggle it a little bit, you can figure out the entire baffling around this engine is loose, including the oil cooler, and it's all just hanging on by some thread somewhere. Then again, this is a rental airplane at a flight school here in Florida, and they rent it for a pretty penny too. So definitely uh, go ahead and really reach in there. Don't just look through the inspection hatch. Stick your arm in there, bump things around. See if you hear any weird noises or things shifting around that you need to keep an eye out for. Back to our 172 again. The baffling on the front. Cracked. Uh, big old crack. You can kind of see this uh, with your just naked eyes, but you might have to actually go ahead and push and prod real gently on things underneath the cowling to see the cracks spread apart and then realize, oh, hey, that's cracked. That's bad. I should probably bring that to someone's attention before I go fly this thing. Oh, other things I love about flight schools in Florida, that they kind of go to Home Depot because they don't have the right parts and then they just make stuff. So you can see this baffling is totally cut with like some weird janky hacksaw because I don't believe Cessna sells any parts that are cut like <coughs> like that around where these cables are coming out. But that cable you see there is the starter cable. So it's that big, heavy, 24 volt, uh, high amperage cable going right to your starter, chafing against that janky baffling there. And as that vibrates in flight and cuts into that starter cable, that baffling is probably grounded out to the engine. And once upon a time, when you do turn the starter and the baffling's finally cut through the insulation on that big, heavy, high amperage wire, well, when you go to start, you're going to get a really big spark underneath the front of the, uh, right in the front of the cowling there, right where the starter is. And if you happen to have some fuel vapor and some oil, like most engines do, it could make a really awesome fireworks show or a little fire right in front of your face there. So, um, yeah, A, this is a problem because it's chafing. B, it's a problem because it's not the right part and definitely nothing you cut janky like that is PMA approved. So, yeah, if you see stuff like this, it's probably not supposed to be in the end of the airplane in the first place. Oh, and this other little oil line or fuel line that was uh, attached there, that's not looking so hot. So you can see where there's lots of corrosion, rust, and I can't quite tell just by looking at it. I want to say that's oil. Um, so yeah, it looks like in time, you know, it will fracture and spray oil all over the place. So you'll lose oil pressure on the engine, but not before coating the engine in oil. So that when you're in flight, you'll get that awesome, you know, engine fire thing going on as the engine quits because of lack of oil. So, you know, really the whole trifecta is what they're going for here with this awesome flight instruction airplane. Next, we've got these little scat tubes. So those little orange tubes you see are called scat tubing. Uh, it stands for something that escapes me at the moment. Uh, not really too important, but what is important is that scat tubing has metal wire going through it. It's usually just regular steel wire and that regular steel wire tends to rust and corrode and crack and fail in time. What happens with that is then the scat tubing collapses and is no longer a tube. It's more of a flat hosey thing. It's like the that little flat hose they used to have on TV on the commercials so that would fold up real nice and it was promised never to kink. It was such lies. Uh, but in any case, scat tubing should not have wires, you know, that inside its internal structure falling apart. It should be replaced long before that. Part of the hazard with that 
is air is flowing through that. And SCAT tubes are used for a lot of different things like heating uh, for carb heat, heating for the cabin, uh, air intake. The hazard we worry about when that internal structure of the SCAT tubing starts to fail, that wire, as it rusts and fails, those little bits of rust and chunks of wire will, if it's hooked up to the carb heat side or hooked up to the engine intake side in any way, it will go into the engine and you'll be sucking in because it's behind the air filter at that point. It'll be sucking in those rust particles and those chunks of metal right up into the engine, into the cylinders, and it makes these awful noises typically shortly before the engine fails or it fails a cylinder or something. So really not a good idea with that. Um, it's a really cheap fix. I mean, scat tubing is only like a couple bucks a foot, so it's easy for them to replace and it definitely should be replaced uh, long before it gets to this particular state. Next, don't hesitate to pull up the carpets in the airplanes. It's really easy. I mean, even if they are Velcroed down or something or snapped down, they're typically not screwed to the floor. You can typically peel back the carpet and look and learn a lot. Now, at first look, you may say, this looks pretty normal to me. And it kind of looked normal to me too until the mechanic's like, well, yeah, except for that crease there, right in the, uh, right by where the flashlight's aimed, that's actually the floor being buckled from when the nose gear got hit so hard that it wrinkled the firewall in this airplane. We're still looking at the same 172 with the wrinkled firewall. So floorboard's buckled. So if you didn't have a chance to catch it by looking at the firewall, if you didn't get your flashlight in there and look at it good enough, then maybe just by lifting up the carpet, you'd see the floorboards buckled and you'd go, huh, I need to take a closer look at this whole area, floorboard forward towards, you know, engine firewall and towards the nose here where there could have been some sort of impact from a student flaring at 10 feet like they always like to do. Um, and here's another little view of our buckled floorboard. Just pick up the carpets. You know, it's really easy to do on your pre-flight. And do you have to do it every time? Well, you don't have to, um, especially if you own the airplane, you're the only one flying it. But it, I like to do it, um, even when I do own the airplane and I'm the only one flying it, because things do change, you know? And so, you know, like to take a peek. Maybe I'm not looking for buckled floorboards, but looking for cracks forming, corrosion, weird things, you know, fall loose, that maybe a screw fell loose from the panel and is rolling around down there on the floor now. Now here we've got an awesome view of an airplane that just came out of a 100 hour inspection. So 100 hour inspection, you know, they should be checking over the entire airplane looking for cracks, corrosion, bad things. Well, clearly this wheel assembly wasn't really inspected that well because, well, it's really dirty. So how on earth could you possibly inspect it if it's not clean? So you can't see through all the grime and grease and dirt to actually see if there's any cracks, rust, corrosion, things like that. So clearly the 100 hour wasn't really done quite right. So if you're renting this airplane, probably want to go find a different one to rent. Uh, you just cannot see through all that stuff. Plus all that accumulated dirt and grime and grease just attracts moisture and attracts more things that are going to cause corrosion in the long term. So that makes something to watch out for. Now, as a side note, if you happen to own an airplane and you're worried about cracked cylinders or uh, you're sending off your camshaft or crankshaft for inspection or you're worried about cracks forming around where the gear meets the fuselage or something like that, there's this awesome test called a dye test or a fluorescent penetrant test. And it's non-destructive. They often call it non-destructive testing. What it is, they just basically put this neon glowing dye on the part and then show it underneath a black light. And that little neon dye finds any cracks or crevices and lights up. So you can easily see if there's any cracks on that particular part. Great for camshafts, crankshafts, the outsides of cylinders, if you think there's a crack in one of your cylinders on your engine, uh, anything like that. It's a good thing to talk to your A&P or mechanic about. And that's when they talk about dye penetrant testing or uh, fluorescent dye testing or non-destructive testing. That's generally what they're talking about is this black light with uh, this kind of neon fluorescent liquid that they put on the part. Next here, uh, just a little mid. Just a little image of an uh, airplane that got pulled out of the hangar. Somebody came by, said, hey, I want to fly that airplane. They went out, pulled the airplane out for the owner. Well, upon closer inspection, when they connect the tow bar, they nicked the valve stem. Is that a huge deal? Probably not the end of the world, but it's going to leak a little bit of air now. So as he goes and flies on his cross-country flight three hours away, he might be landing with a flat nose gear tire. Luckily, he noticed this on his pre-flight because he was taking his time moving in sections and happen to be able to see this. Whereas if you just looked at the whole airplane for an overall condition, you might miss something so small like this. Now here's one of my favorites where I got a free pair of awesome high quality channel lock made in the USA pliers right here. So when you're flying an airplane and you hear some weird noises or you just get a strange feeling in your gut about something or you're doing the pre-flight and you look down into the cabin through that little tiny inspection hatch and you something kind of catches your eye, don't 
you know, hesitate to do a little double take, maybe go grab a flashlight, take a closer look, and follow your gut. You know, if you hear any weird noises or you just think something might be up, like this particular scenario where something just didn't seem quite right when I was looking in the catalog, so I grabbed a flashlight, took a closer look, and I found a free pair of pliers. Because, you know, nobody's really going to own up to actually leave them behind, so one of the A&Ps that worked on the airplane said it was theirs, I kept them. Next, this is a carburetor bowl. So this is part of the carburetor off of a Cessna 150 that I had, that same Cessna 150 that well, they left the uh, pair of channel locks behind. What's that orange goo in the carburetor bowl? Well, let me give you a little backstory here. The Cessna 150 I bought that was parked down in Venice, Florida, right near the ocean where we get a lot of rain. And it was parked on the ramp for probably several years, two, three years, something like that. Um, it flew, you know, I saw it fly from time to time, so I didn't think it had been sitting for that long, but clearly it had been. And there was some water in the fuel tanks. So what did we do? Well, we sumped the tanks, we got the water out. We sumped the gas later, we got the water out, and then we went and flew it. But it kind of periodically ran a little rough. So after something the tanks again, finding more water, and chasing our tail on it for a while, we decided to go ahead and pull apart the entire fuel system. We found this nice orange goo in the carburetor because once the liquid, once the water gets past the gas glader, that's the last lowest point, and it goes to the carburetor, there's no more drain for you to sump and drain water or contaminants out of. There's a little plug that the mechanic could go ahead and remove, a little bolt, and drain the carburetor. In this case, we went ahead and just pulled the whole thing apart to really see what was going on inside there. Now, it was a good thing because this neon orange liquid is really just water that's reacted with some of the steel in the fuel system on the 150 and rusted it out and caused a lot of problems. So it was a good thing that we found it because although we were something the tanks and not getting any more water out, we obviously still had some serious problems that as we were flying, there was some rusty water sitting in that carburetor bowl. And when you hit the right bump, it would suck up the water instead of fuel and the engine doesn't run so well on water. If they did, it would be so much cheaper to learn how to fly. It would be amazing but it doesn't, it runs on fuel, not rusty water. So, didn't work out so well for us. The funny thing is, you could sump the tanks on this thing and it would be just fuel, and then you would go taxi it around a bit. This is how I usually try to make sure to get all the water out. If I do find water in a pre-flight, once I get it all out, I'll go ahead and taxi the airplane around a little bit, make some sharp turns, and then sump it again, and I usually find a little more water. And you just keep doing that and doing that and doing that. But the proper way to really attack this is go all the way to the source, right? Drain the tanks, drain the carburetor, the entire fuel system, make sure it's totally clear of any sort of contaminants. Now, this brings up climates, right? So climate plays a big part in this. If that airplane had been parked in Arizona, probably would never have had this problem, and I would probably be a few thousand dollars ahead of where I am now. But I'm not, it was parked in Florida. So Florida, high humidity, lots of rain, versus Arizona, New Mexico. Guess what, when the Air Force had to park a whole bunch of old airplanes, they chose Arizona, not Florida, because they might actually last a little while out in Arizona in that nice dry climate. So, obviously rain, humidity, temperature, snow, sun, UV rays, all plays a big part. Salt from the ocean is a big thing here in Florida. Now, how the aircraft stored is a big deal too. Obviously, the Air Force isn't paying to hangar all these old airplanes, they're probably never gonna fly again. But, the airplane that you're flying, either renting or think about buying or own, how you store it is important. A hangar is obviously very good, but the condition of the hangar should be taken into consideration, right? Like, if you have a hangar and there's a bunch of birds living in there crapping all over your airplane, that's going to eat into the paint and probably cause a little bit of corrosion here and there. Now, is the hangar heated? That's really cool in the wintertime. It's not so hard on everything, getting really cold. But do you have a Tannis heater on the airplane? What if the guy that you bought the airplane from said, oh yeah, I've got a Tannis heater on it. I always heat it up and preheated it before I start it in the winter so it was nice and gentle on the engine. Well, that's great. It's nice and easy on the engine when you have warm oil to start with. But if you left it plugged in for four months during the winter and then never flew it, that could be a problem, and here's why. You might think leaving it plugged in is a good thing, but you're ultimately heating the oil, so the oil might be, you know, 80, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and the hangar temperature is probably 10, 20, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, so that means the outer parts of your engine case, the you know, the middle of the actual engine case and the cylinders are probably that 20, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, really cold. So there's going to be some moisture in the air. Maybe some moisture in the air that's inside the crankcase. It's going to be heated by that warm oil and that tannis heater. High humidity, the air absorbs the moisture, the air floats up and circulates through the crankcase as it's warmer, it rises, it hits the cold top of the crankcase. The moisture condenses against the crankcase into water droplets, the water droplets run down. 
they help rust some things in the process, like your camshaft and your cylinders, and then it goes back down to the oil, and then it kind of just comes back up again and evaporates, and it produces this beautiful rainforest effect inside of your very expensive Lycoming or Continental engine. Um, kind of problematic. So that's why, if you're not going to fly the airplane for a long time in the winter, better off just leaving it unplugged, not keeping it preheated. It's great in a heated hangar, but no need to actually preheat the engine while the rest of it's staying cold. If you're going to leave the airplane for just a day or two and then go back and fly it, yeah, sure, plug it in when you're done flying, keep it nice and warm. That way it's warm when you come back tomorrow to go fly it again. Pest is also another thing to talk about. So, pests living in the airplane, big thing we get is uh, mice living in old tailwheel airplanes, old cloth fabric airplanes. So I had a Champ once, and there was a mouse living in it. How could you tell? Well, um, the smell of dead mice is a big giveaway. The uh, nesting material and uh, the mouse poop and pee all over the fabric is a big giveaway when you look up in there with an inspection uh, mirror. The trouble is the mouse pee kind of eats away at the fabric and really hurts it, and the cost of recovering a Champ or a Cub right about now is somewhere in the twenty-five dollars to $30,000 mark from what I've been quoted. Uh, so, pretty expensive. Uh, definitely want to cut down on the pests that could possibly be living in your airplane. The other thing you can do with a fabric airplane, whether it's pest related or just uh, the fabric and paint and dope wearing out, if you want to know what kind of shape it's in, go ahead and pull it out in the sun, remove an inspection hatch, and then look up into the wing. It should be totally dark. If you see any light coming through, then obviously the paint and the dope is wore out, any pinholes or any light shining through, and that UV light is now starting to hit the fabric, deteriorate the fabric so it's not as strong as it should be, and that's a big problem for the fabric passing inspection, plus being safe enough to fly. So fabric airplanes should be nice and dark inside the wing. That would be good. Any airplane should really be nice and dark inside the wing, otherwise there's probably some pinholes or something somewhere that aren't really supposed to be there. Now let's go ahead and take a look at another awesome flight training airplane. This is a Flight School's Piper Arrow that hopefully no one's flying right now. There are some little pinholes in the exhaust here, a nice little crack going up the side. Trouble with that crack is the exhaust is really hot, so that's why we have exhaust pipes. It deflects the really hot gases away from the cowling and away from the cabin and out past the airplane. And all those gases are also really toxic to breathe too. Now if you have a crack, while well, those gases are going to start to escape, higher and higher up the pipe, and they're going to be getting into the engine compartment that's not really designed to handle quite that much heat, and it's not really designed to handle all those toxic gases like carbon monoxide that will probably eventually make its way into the cabin and affect you, the pilot, and the passengers. So, and not in a positive way either, by the way. So, exhaust cracks are a problem. What I'd like to see here, that would make me feel more comfortable as a renter, is if I saw this little crack here, and then I saw a little hole where somebody actually took a drill and the mechanic drilled out a hole that's called stop drilling, where they drill a little hole in it. Now that crack's not going to continue to spread any higher, or hopefully not any higher. Uh, not that seeing that hole in a crack's a good thing to see, you like to see nothing, but at least if I saw a hole made by a drill, I'd know that an A&P or IA had seen it and done something about it and felt that it was still airworthy, compared to this, where it looks like maybe no one has paid any attention to it, or have been made aware of it, and that could be a problem. So maybe I'd bring it to someone's attention before going flying, along with a lot of other things on this aircraft, like the brand new paint job it has. Remember when we talked about painting a turd earlier on in the presentation? Yeah, this is kind of one of those times. So as we can see here, nobody bothered to remove the flight controls from this airplane before painting it. Now, I'm not 100% up to speed on what the maintenance manual says and when painting a Piper Arrow, but typically you remove the flight controls like aileron, stabilator, rudder from the aircraft when you're painting so you can statically balance them afterwards so you don't get any sort of aerodynamic flutter when you're flying the airplane later on down the road. It's kind of an important thing. So I'm guessing this one wasn't really done all up to snuff. It kind of made me feel a little wary as a renter. Probably not really a legal paint job. Probably shouldn't be flying this sort of airplane. As you can see here, they were even too lazy to even move the position of the stabilator, let alone remove the entire stabilator from the aircraft when they were painting, so they got the little overspray line there on where they painted their silver stripe. Here, more overspray, and here, one of my favorite parts, yeah, so you got the pitot vein, kind of an important part that tells you how fast you're going through the air, and they didn't really bother to even wrap any newspaper or tape or anything around it. They just sprayed right on it. So now your pitot vein, has a bunch of paint right near the little inlet hole, and that little inlet hole is probably not getting air the exact way it was designed. So maybe your airspeed's a little bit off now. You can even see the propeller blade here, where 
they didn't feel the need to tape up or anything and they just sprayed away and now there's overspray all over the propeller blade. So definitely a lot of things going on with this airplane that aren't quite right, which brings us to the next item with this airplane that's not quite right, the leaky fuel sump. Now, how do I know it's leaking? Well, it's blue around it. You can be like, well, that's really dark blue. That's obviously not fuel. Well, by the way, fuel's not blue when it comes out of the ground, just so you know. They dye it. And what happens is when fuel leaks, it evaporates, especially here in Florida where it's nice and hot. And when it evaporates, it leaves the blue dye behind. So it gets a lot darker blue than you're used to seeing. So that's where that really dark blue color is coming from is actually fuel leaking from the fuel sump or around the threads of the fuel sump. Probably something that should be addressed. So probably not the best flight training airplane out there on the market, but lots of them look like that, I'm sure. Here we've got a nice little tailwheel airplane. So we've got a tailwheel tire, and although there's tread on the tire, there's lots of cracks in it. Good time to replace this tire before it happens to explode because the little tailwheel tires turn oh so quickly trying to keep up with those main gear because they're such a small diameter, they spin really fast, and there's a lot of stress put on them. So it'd be a good thing to replace before it explodes and you start dragging your very expensive tailwheel assembly and rim down the runway. Here's an example of some tow bar damage to a nose gear tire on a, um, this is actually on a jet. So that tire's spinning at several, or over 100 miles an hour anyways. And anything like that should probably be addressed before you go flying and see exactly how fast the tire can spin before rubber chunks start to fly off of it. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and take a little break here and rest my voice while you guys watch this cool little video about the service difficulty reporting system and what that is it's a way, kind of like ASRS reports are for us pilots, the ASRS reports work for mechanics as well, but this is specifically for mechanics out there that notice something wrong with airplanes, especially if they notice it wrong over and over again, to report about it and let the FAA know. And maybe from these reports, a bulletin will be issued or an airworthiness directive. So this is how we actually keep up with some of the things that are happening to our airplane that aren't ADs yet. So maybe there's no AD issued on the is for the issue, but Maybe other mechanics have noticed, hey, all these fuel valves and these old 172s are really giving us some trouble. You might want to go ahead and take a look at yours, make sure it's not having the same problem that other people are before, you know, it shuts off in flight or something. So a great place to learn about your old airplane or an old airplane that you're going to be flying is on the FAA's service difficulty reporting system. So if you come here to av.info.fa.gov sdrx, we can go ahead and search reports. And what this is, it's this service difficulty reporting system. So people can submit reports, a and P's mostly submitting reports, with aircraft that they're having trouble with, that they notice things that are amiss, that are unsafe, they notice trends, they can submit a report on that. So we can go here and say the aircraft make is a Cessna, and we want to look at the model. Uh, let's say we want to look at Oh, we've got a 172K model. So let's see all the reports for 172Ks. Hit run query. And now here we've loaded up every single report on a 172K model that's ever been submitted to this system for the FAA's service difficulty reporting system. Now, there's a lot of reports here. And if you wanted to get more specific, you could actually go ahead and tighten up that query for things you're looking for, like maybe wing spar or brakes or axles or something like that. You could just, when you have some free time, go ahead and click through here. And this is where all that hanger talk comes from that you hear about. People talking about, oh, this is a problem or that's a common problem. That's where these things come from. That's where guys find out about it or they find out by actually working on the airplane themselves. But you can see what the issue was and basically some other information about it, what part it was. Maybe they put in what the total time was. So you could see at what airframe total time, or what engine total time problems were occurring. It's just a great system to go back and see what exactly is happening with these older airplanes that we fly. On this particular one, they noted that the engine was warm and we started the warm engine. It was a Cessna with a light combing, 0320 E2D. It caught fire before it started. The recommendation, eh, let the engine cool off a little longer or modify the starting procedure because he followed the warm engine startup procedure and it caught fire. So maybe take a little look at how many pumps you're giving in a primer or what exactly you're doing to start a warm engine. Here's a report about a 172K from not too long ago, from 2015. And it says, the pilot complained that the fuel selector was very stiff. He cycled it a couple of times and it seized in the left tank position. 
Fuel was drained and the selector was removed. The detent ball was found to be rough, chrome peeling slightly, small amount of corrosion. Detent ball and spring was replaced with new. Detent plate was cleaned and inspected and lubricated. The fuel selector was reinstalled and checked for leaks and function. Works smooth and detents are apparent now. No signs of binding, stiffness, or seizing. But that's something to look out for. So clearly there was some chrome peeling. There was some internal things going wrong, some internal corrosion on that fuel selector valve on that 172K model. So a little bit of an older airplane and starting to have a few little problems here. Total time on the airplane was 3,218. Why this is so great is maybe your fuel selector valve was replaced five, 10 years ago, and you want to see if it's the same part number that's affected. So you can even see the part number he put in here of that fuel selector valve. So really great system to go ahead and dig into in depth what's going on with specific aircraft models. There's a lot of reports in here. They date back quite a ways. And especially on older aircraft, there's a lot of reports, a lot of information about those older airplanes and some of the problems that are occurring. So if you go ahead and take the time to actually go on that service difficulty reporting system, what are you going to find when you start searching about your airplane or other airplanes you've flown? Well, you might find pictures like these where they remove the valve cover on just a hunch and they find a bunch of carbon built up or something right next to this valve, something slowly letting go on this light homing engine. You might find things like this where they say, okay, the exhaust gas um, seals are leaking. So right on the exhaust pipe, it's leaking um, or we've put a nut on this uh, stud and it's come off three times and this particular airplane we walked up to didn't have a nut on the exhaust pipe and that obviously led to exhaust leaks and then you can see this chalkiness. So if you see white burnt chalkiness underneath the engine cowl, that's not necessarily dust, it's actually probably signs of heat damage. So in this case you can see the exhaust is actually coming right out of the cylinder uh, right where the exhaust pipe meets the cylinder. It's obviously loose there. There's some exhaust gas coming by and it's hitting the spark plug and probably doing some damage to the plug and to the spark plug wire. It's not really meant to handle that 1500 degree heat coming right out of the cylinder right there. If we look a little further back to the actual firewall of this airplane, you can see that pitting on it. It's not corrosion, say, from just, you know, salty air. It's actually heat damage from the exhaust leaking like that and making the paint bubble off of the firewall. So that's uh, when you see paint bubbling off the firewall like that, it's probably an exhaust leak. And it's actually not that uncommon to see on old Cherokees, Pipers, um, because their exhaust just, well, there's some problems with old Cherokee exhaust, leave it at that. But uh, and I hope I never have to buy another one. But anyways, that's what that is really telling you to keep an eye out for. When you see stuff like that pitting on the firewall, look what could have caused that? Because oftentimes you notice problems on an airplane and the problem you're noticing isn't the problem, you know, paint bubbling on a firewall. Paint more, problem solved. No, the problem's not solved. You actually have to go and figure out why the paint was bubbling in the first place. It was an exhaust leak. Hopefully you see the nut missing off the exhaust pipe there. This cable looks a little worn, so that could be problematic. So we might want to take a closer look at this. That's a flight control cable for your ailerons. And obviously it's been chafing on something. So if you remember back to when we looked inside the fuselage and we were kind of touching the cables, making sure they're not super tight, not super loose. We also make sure that they're not rubbing or chafing on anything like this one was. And when you look a little closer at it and you start to take a closer look, you see, okay, there's actually strands of wire that are broken in there. So it's not as strong as it once was. Be kind of bad if it snapped. How many strands are broken? Doesn't look like too many until you kind of twist it and you figure out, oh crap, this thing isn't really holding together so well anymore. Good thing it was caught by a very astute IMP on a 100 hour inspection. Just looked in like something wasn't quite right on that aileron cable. These are the sorts of things you'll see submitted through the safety difficulty reporting system or service difficulty reporting system, I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and watch another little video here. So we can see here when I'm talking about sections, right? So break the airplane up into sections as if you're that professional photographer because all these inspection hatches look good until we get to this one. And by touching it, you go, uh oh, blue. Yes, that's fuel leaking. So if you just look at the airplane from walking underneath it or look at it from afar, you're probably going to miss that. It's really small. But if you look at it in sections, you can break it down and say, okay, you know, that plate's good. That plate's good. And then you're done with that part of the wing. This part of the wing is good. This part of the wing is good. This part of the wing, um, okay, that looks kind of iffy. Um, that's why I like to carry that rag around and almost just kind of run it along the airplane as I'm doing the pre-flight. Even if I don't see it and miss it, I can look at the rag later and be like, oh, there's stuff on this rag. Where did it come from? And I can retrace my steps and find out what exactly was leaking or where the dirt or grease or grime or fuel in this case came from. Here's another item from SDRS. It's a magneto and the magneto 
failed, obviously, this little uh, piece of metal here on the impulse coupling. So what does that mean to you? Obviously, you're not going to detect that on a pre-flight, but if you start to learn about, well, this failed at about 578 hours, we typically say we like to overhaul mags at 500, replace them at 1,000. Uh, it's kind of a general rule of thumb. You can do it more often or less. Just follow the manufacturer's recommendation, ultimately. Don't listen to me. But that rule's worked out pretty well for me, and in this particular case, it failed at 578, which kind of reinforces my whole, eh, about 500 hours, we should probably take a closer look and remove it and consider either overhauling it or replacing it. Other things you just won't see on a pre-flight, like this particular example that came from the service technical reporting system of this poor Piper Cherokee 180 that did a beautiful takeoff down the runway but left one of the main gear behind. You won't notice that the little retaining washer or retaining nut was worn inside the strutter at the top there. It's really not possible for you to see on a pre-flight. So what does that really mean to us? Well. The service of color reporting system will tell you how many total time airframe hours uh, this occurred at. It'll tell you, you know, maybe it was a flight training airplane or give you a little bit of history on it. So you can start to see, okay, what should I be watching out for on my airplane? What really is an old airplane? Remember that first question we started with? Is it 2,000 hours, 7,000 hours, 25,000 hours on the airframe? Is it flight training airplanes? Is it airplanes that are only flown by grandma on Sundays going to church? What makes an airplane old or new or in good shape or not? So, just some things to think about. This is the bottom of your seat, and I know it's kind of odd to see this, but the seat's flipped upside down, and then the little uh, rollers go into that hole there we see. Where it's circled with the Sharpie there, there's little cracks forming. That's kind of problematic if your seat went ahead and let loose when you were in flight, or broke. Coincidentally enough, I actually watched a seat break. Luckily, it was just uh, before we even started the engine on the airplane, but I saw a seat fracture. Um, that'd be really inconvenient to have happen right at rotation. So, definitely something to keep an eye out for. Think about what's going to get you in the airplane, right? You know, you think, we just don't check the bottom of the seat very often when we're doing a pre-flight because that's, we're looking at the wings, we're looking at tires, and we're looking at brakes and oil and things. But think about what's really going to cause a big problem. What if that seat came off the rails while you were flying? It'd be a big big issue, right? You wouldn't be able to, you'd be trying to pull yourself back up, but you'd be pulling the flight controls and doing all sorts of weird things to the airplane. What we're looking at here is actually the retaining system that holds the seat on this Cessna 172 in place on the seat rail. So what we can see is one's attached and one has come loose, so when you're pulling that latch underneath the seat, it actually pulls the pin out and allows the seat to slide forward and back. In this particular case, I'd come loose, and when the uh, flight instructor and student rotated for takeoff in this 172, the student's seat went sliding onto the back. Luckily, the instructor was there to take the controls and not let the student, you know, pull back on the yoke instinctively and put the airplane into a nice power on stall. Something to keep an eye out for. You know, look at the places that maybe you don't look all the time. We'll go ahead and take a look at one more video here for to wrap up our presentation. Why we don't store props, or why we don't store airplanes with the propellers horizontal when they're parked in an area that's getting a lot of rain. Let's just keep a close look on the eye. Let's just take a closer look here at this propeller as we turn it. Look what happens, a bunch of water dumps out on the ground because the propeller was horizontal, which is cool because here's what you gotta think about, right? If there's morning dew every morning forming on this propeller and it was vertical, that morning dew might run down the blade and then constantly be putting moisture towards the hub and cause corrosion on this constant speed prop. Uh, the flip side of that is, at least it would have been draining out when we had that big heavy rain that filled the entire spinner and then the airplane sat there for months with a full spinner of water. What did more damage? So when I put an airplane in the hangar, I actually tend to leave the prop kind of horizontal. When it's outside, it's kind of a 50-50 shot. When it's horizontal, sometimes birds land on them and poop on them and then the poop eats through the uh, paint on the props. I don't like that. Sometimes I leave them vertical. Sometimes I'll leave them at a 45 and kind of compromise. Um, I do like spinners that drain for this very reason, but also just putting proper vertical would solve that problem so you don't have water accumulating in your spinner and then uh, messing up your propeller hub. So I know we use more than 60 minutes of your time. I do greatly apologize, but hopefully it was useful. Hopefully you found this useful and you got some value out of it. The quote of the day is safety is not expensive guys. It's priceless. So, at this point, how old would you say is old? Is this old? Is it too old to fly? I don't know. But 
Hopefully you're thinking a little bit differently about what an old airplane really is. It's not just something from the 1940s or 50s, it may be something from the early 2000s that has been neglected, and something from the 1940s may be in even better shape than something rolling off the assembly line at Cessna today. So, any questions, like we said, go ahead, email them to cfi at flightmikealpha.com. Go ahead and post them in the comments below on the fast page of Flight Mike Alpha. Post them in the comments on the YouTube uh, site if you're watching this live on YouTube right now, and we will do our very best to answer them. You can also click on just flightmikealpha.com, click ask a question, and get an answer from one of our CFIs. I'm going to go ahead and take a short break here, let you guys submit your questions. I'll come back in just a few minutes. If there are any questions, we'll try to answer them. Otherwise, if I don't see you guys, have a great night. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to log on to the General Aviation Awards, generalaviationawards.com. It's put on by the FAA. If there's a mechanic, CFI, anyone in aviation uh, that you think is doing an excellent job in advancing aviation safety, go ahead and nominate them for an award. That's an awesome thing to do to help pay it back. And as always, fly regularly with your CFI. Try to perfect practice, practice perfectly. Document your activity in wings. Check out all the other awesome courses at fasafety.gov. Check out the courses on flyatmikealpha.com uh, who hosted this event for us, thankfully. And as always, guys, fly safe.